encouraging. And um, in, the, in your bulletin, there's a little prayer points thing. Let me just look at the last one with you, number five, which really talks about the Word of God. It's taken from our message last Sunday morning, and then we'll get into our teaching in Galatians. But uh, number five there, it says, Now as Jesus finishes talking to Martha, he gets back to what Mary was doing and what a message it is. But one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part which will not be taken away from her. To put it another way, Jesus said, there is really only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and I won't take it away from her. Jesus was directing Martha to the main thing for her to be concerned about. It was the part that Mary had discovered. Mary was listening to Jesus teach her. Many people who are genuine Christians have not discovered what Mary had. Many, many Christians, probably the vast majority of Christians, have not discovered this. What is it? To be a person who reads their Bibles daily and regularly. Father, would you please put the desire for your word in each of our hearts, make us learners and listeners and doers, Lord. Make us to be those who sit day by day at your feet, Lord. So, a great area to pray for. Well, let's open our Bibles to the book of Galatians, please, chapter 4. And if you'll stand with me to your feet for just a moment, Galatians chapter 4. If you need a Bible, if you'll please just raise your hand in the air, one of the ushers will be happy to get a Bible for you. Galatians chapter 4, Paul says, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all, but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son, into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. But then indeed, when you did not know God, you served those which by nature are not gods. But now after you have known God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you turn again to the weak beggarly elements to which you desire to be in bondage. You observe days and months and seasons and years. I am afraid for you, lest I have labored for you in vain. Father, we thank you so much that your son, Jesus Christ, did not labor in vain when he went to the cross He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God. We thank you, Lord, that for any who call upon Jesus Christ to be saved, the Bible says they will be saved. And anyone who comes to Jesus will not be turned away. And so for those of us, Father, who by your grace have turned away from sin and turned to Jesus Christ. You have saved us. All glory and all honor belongs to you. And you have promised to complete and finish the good work that you have begun in us. We look forward to being with you in heaven. And we pray, Lord, that while we're here, 
you would cause us to grow, you would help us to become rooted and grounded and to grow in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen. If you go back into chapter 3, in verse 22, it helps us to get a little running start into the fourth chapter because these two chapters really go so well together. They're one continuous thought. And in verse 22, Paul says, But the scripture has confined all under sin, that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. And of course, the Bible, when he says all have been confined under sin, it's speaking of the fact that the law has shown that each one of us is a sinner. And the Lord has done that so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. Therefore, the law was our tutor or teacher to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. So several times, Paul has mentioned the word promise, and he's mentioned the word faith. And in the book of Galatians, we have really Paul's manifesto, or his uh, great writing to defend God's amazing grace. That's what Paul was doing when he wrote the book of Galatians. He was in the defensive mode against false teachers, people, Jewish people called Judaizers, who would follow Paul around. They would go to the places where he had preached, and when he was at these places, he preached the gospel of salvation, not by the works of the law, but by the hearing of faith and by simply believing in Christ. And, and so his message, which is the message of the Bible, is that a person cannot save themselves by their good works. Only Christ can save a person who puts their faith in him. And what the Judaizers were doing is coming behind Paul, coming to the very converts that he had led to Christ, and they were seducing them. They were bewitching them is the word that he actually uses. And they would tell these converts, look, what Paul has told you is, is kind of true. Jesus is the Savior, but in order for you to be saved, you really need to keep the law of Moses. And if you don't keep the law of Moses, you cannot be saved. And so the people were unwittingly accepting this false teaching and they were being brought back under the law, brought back into legalism. And so the book of Galatians is defending the pure gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ against people who were seeking to enslave the people of God with the bondage of legalism. In Galatians, Jesus redeems us from the law. And so... What Paul is doing here in this very forceful letter is he's confronting this false gospel of works and he demonstrates the superiority of justification by faith. He's trying to say, look, uh, 
is defending and explaining and applying the gospel of grace. And he argues that we are made right with God, not by our own works, but through the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. And to believe anything else means going back to the bondage of trying to earn God's approval by following rules. And it is a matter of heaven and hell. So very, very serious. And so as he's laying out the case here, in chapter 4, having spoken about uh, what we were before faith came and so on, he says, now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all, but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the father. So he's saying, think of it this way. If a father dies and leaves an inheritance for his young children, those children are not much better off than slaves until they grow up even though they actually own everything their father had. They have to obey their guardians until they reach whatever age their father set. And that's the way it was with us before Christ came. We were like children. We were slaves to the basic principles of this world. So he's likening that period of time uh, prior to the coming of Christ, when the law was present. Um, and he says in verse 3, even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. So when the right time came, God sent his son, Jesus Christ, born of a woman, and he was subject to the law, and God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. So... An heir, father might have a child, he's an heir, but he really is no different than the slaves in those households until, uh, though he, uh, he's no different than the slaves in those households, though he is the master of all. He's under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the father. Even so, he says, when we were children, and so he's trying to use and apply this metaphor here, even so, when we were children, we're in bondage under the elements of the world. God's people in the Old Testament were people who had placed their faith in, Christ, in God, but they were under the old covenant, they were under the law. And even though they were God's people, they were like children who were heirs of God, but they had to wait until the time appointed by the Father to receive all of the blessings that were theirs. And so the people in the Old Testament under the law, uh, they didn't enjoy the kind of relationship that we have with God. They were in bondage under the elements of the world. They were prisoners. However, we're told, but when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. So God had the Old Covenant, the Old Testament. The Old Testament prophesied that the Messiah was going to come. And when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. So there came a point in time when the father said to the son, uh, 
this is the time for you to go into the world. The Holy Spirit is going to come upon Mary, and she's going to become pregnant with you. She's a virgin. She'll be impregnated by the Holy Spirit. And so thus, God became a man, born of a woman, and Jesus was born under the law. He was born under that covenant. And the reason that God sent him was to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law. What Jesus did is he fulfilled the law, and as we accept him, we're set free from the law. He was sent to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law, and that is what Jesus Christ has done. In verse 5, he says, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Now, uh, in that culture, slavery was a common reality, and a person would go to the slave market, and they could purchase a slave, and they could do one of two things with the slave. They could either keep the slave as a slave, or upon purchasing the slave, they could let the slave go free. We were enslaved to the law. The whole world was enslaved to the law. What Jesus did by coming to the earth and by dying upon the cross, he paid the price to redeem us from slavery. You see, we were enslaved to the law, the law demanded righteousness, or we were bound for judgment. The law says you have to obey every part of the law, or there's no way that you can be right with God. That's slavery. It's bondage. The Ten Commandments, no one has been able to fulfill those commandments. So what God did is he sent his own son into the world who came into the world as a man. He came into the world under the law. He came into the world sinless, and he fulfilled the law perfectly. He never broke one law, not even in the slightest way, not even a, a, a very small fraction of the law. Fulfilled the law completely. So that's one thing he did, is he fulfilled the law. The second thing he did, as a man, he paid for our sinfulness. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. We've sinned. All of us have sinned. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. We've all sinned, and the, the demand for sin, the payment for sin, is death. So Christ became our substitute. He died in your place. His death was to pay for your sins. So, so far you have two things that Jesus has done. One, he fulfilled the law completely. Two, he paid the price of the law. He paid what the law demands. He paid for your sins. So you have a righteous man who now has paid for your sins. That death upon the cross is God's method of redemption, of purchasing you and I through faith in Christ. God says then, thirdly, he says, I have a righteous son. He's paid for your sins. And if you by faith will believe in him, you will be saved. And so uh, Christ came to, through his death to purchase us out of the slavery of the law. Without a redeemer, without being set free, we would be in bondage. We would, uh, we'd, we'd have to obey the law of God in order to be saved. Well, we don't have to because Christ has obeyed the law. Christ has paid the law 
the penalty of the law. And when you turn to Jesus Christ, uh, not only does he regenerate you and give you life, but he, but God gives to you the very righteousness of Jesus Christ. So Christ's death wasn't to purchase you and can keep you a slave, it was to purchase you so that you could be free. The Bible says you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And the truth is Christ. He is the truth. He is completely righteous. He's completely acceptable to God. He's paid for your sins. And by you receiving him, you're made acceptable to God. Salvation is by faith in Christ. It's not by the keeping of the law. So these Judaizers were going around saying, it's not enough that you just believe in Christ. You have to do all of these other things. You have to keep all of these other rules, all of these special holidays, all of these special religions, and unless uh, special rituals, and unless you do, you cannot be saved. And these poor converts who were not well-rooted and well-grounded in the word of God, they began to believe this. And so rather than going on in maturity as Christians, they were going backwards into legalism and backwards into the law from which they had come. And in the book of Acts, it's described as a yoke of bondage which neither we nor our fathers were able to bear. When you think of a person who was put in the stocks where they're bent over and their head is in the hole and their hands are in the hole and their feet are in the hole and it's a painful situation. My wife has one of these at home. She puts me in there. It's a painful situation to be in. Uh, you're, you're in bondage. You can't escape it. Who can, who can live a life that demands perfection? Nobody except Jesus Christ. He did it. He not only had never sinned before he came here, but he never sinned while he was here. And the whole purpose of his death was to set you and I free. And, and he's purchased us so that we could be free and, and by believing in, in him. So in verse 5, he says, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And the idea here, the adoption as sons, is that we would be placed as fully Belonging to God as Jesus Christ belongs to God. That's what God has done with you. When he adopted you, he, he put you in just as you're, you are as much one of his children as Jesus Christ is his only begotten son. So imagine how, not imagine, but just to ponder for a moment the fact that this wonderful truth of why God sent Jesus into the world it was to accomplish what you could never accomplish. You could never keep the law of God. Jesus, in the gospel, said to the Pharisees, he said, well, if you want to go to heaven, he said, you have to be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Well, who could do that? He said, your righteousness has to exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees. Well, who could do that? And then he spoke to the Pharisees and he said, now look, you've heard that it's been said that you shall not murder. It's in the Ten Commandments. And they would have said, oh yes, we, that's right, it's wrong to murder people. He said, well, I'm saying to you, if you hate your brother, you have murdered him. They would have understood then, oh, okay, then... The law is not merely requiring that I not do certain things by my actions, 
but the law demands that inwardly I not even have these feelings or these thoughts. Well, who has not hated someone? I mean, just go on the 405 for 10 minutes. You could go through any one of the Ten Commandments and realize that the law was designed to, not to save you, but to show you that you're a sinner. And it's not by just what you don't do outwardly, but it's who you are inwardly. And so when Jesus came here, he both outwardly never sinned, And he inwardly never sinned. He was perfectly righteous. So a perfectly righteous man went to the cross and he became sin. He became unrighteous. He paid the full penalty for our sins. He died. He satisfied the justice of God. He died for our sins. He was literally separated from God on the cross. He, his soul was separated from his body. He, his body was placed in a tomb. And then on the third day, he was raised from the dead to show that he had conquered death. So he is righteous. He paid for sin conquered Satan, conquered death, rose from the dead, and then ascended up into heaven and was welcomed into heaven. And God says, whoever will believe in him, I'll give to you everything that he is. I'll take all that Jesus is and I'll put it on your account. He's completely righteous. Sin has been paid for. He's accepted by me. And when you come to Christ, you become completely accepted by God by your faith in Jesus Christ, not by your keeping of the law. And that was the whole issue. That's why Paul was writing to these Galatian churches, because these Judaizers were coming around and saying, no, wait a minute, you have to do this, and you have to do that, and you have to do this, and you have to do that. And Paul is writing to say, no, 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 not at all. You've been adopted as a son by faith in Christ, verse 6. And because you are sons, because you're in God's family, here's something else. God has not only adopted you and placed you as a son, but because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son, the Holy Spirit, into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. The Holy Spirit comes into the life of a person who's saved, and through the work of the Holy Spirit, we're brought into a relationship with God. The Holy Spirit in the heart of the believer shows his acceptance with God as a son and an heir. It's, it's really the, it is really the supreme evidence of salvation that the Spirit of God dwells inside of you. The word Abba is an Aramaic word for father or daddy. Uh, it's a, a word of intimacy. The, the Jews under the law had no concept of an intimate, personal relationship with God. Um, Even to this day, if you go to Israel and speak to Orthodox Jews, uh, they, they they have no sense that there's a personal fellowship between them and God. They they simply know I have to pick this up at a certain time and I have to put this over here on this day and I can't do this on that day because God doesn't want me to do that and I have to obey him. There, there's no sense of, God, you're my father. And, and the word that is used here uh, is a word that would speak of more of a child sitting on its father's lap and, and being embraced by his father and 
feeling that sense of warmth and that freedom to communicate. The Jews had none of that. But for the Christian, God has sent forth not only his son, but the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. So you and I as believers, we have this relationship with God by faith, not by works. And so in verse 7, he says, Therefore, you are no longer a slave. You're no longer a slave, but you're a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. So this is our identification. We're no longer enslaved to the law. We're sons and we're daughters of God. And as the children of God, we're heirs of God through Christ. But then he says in verse 8, indeed, when you did not know God, he's having stated now what we are, He's trying to show them the error of their going back to the law by showing them what you were, he says. But then, indeed, when you did not know God, he's trying to remind them, you remember when you didn't know him, you served those which by nature are not gods. But now, after you have known God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you turn again to the weak and the beggarly elements to which you desire to be in bondage. Look, you, you were serving um, those things which by nature are not gods, and now after having come into a relationship of knowing God, and then he specifies, or rather are known by God, you have this relationship, how is it that you're turning again back to these weak and these beggarly elements, he calls them. Before you Gentiles knew God, and these were Gentiles, he says you were slave to so-called gods that they didn't even exist. I mean, think of what these people did. They worshipped these false gods. They were enslaved to them, and these gods were non-existent. And he says, so now that you know God, you've come into a relationship, or should I say now that God knows you, why do you want to go back again and become slaves once more to weak and useless spiritual principles of this world? Why would you want to go back into nothing, into legalism? In verse 10, he says, you observe days and months and seasons and years. I am afraid for you, lest I have labored in vain. You're trying to earn your favor with God by observing certain days and months or seasons or years. I'm afraid for you. He says, perhaps all my hard work with you was for nothing. He was very, very concerned about that. Here they are now in, in a relationship with God by faith through what Christ has done. And along come these false teachers saying, oh, no, 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 you, you must go into the law of God. You must observe these holidays, these special religious days. He says, how, how could you do that? How could you go back, back to that which enslaved you? And he said, I'm really worried about you. I'm so concerned, I'm, I'm fearful that all of the work that I've done to teach you has been for nothing. He was extremely concerned. Anytime somebody says to you that in order to be accepted by God, you not only need Jesus, but you must do these other things as well, to be saved, they're telling you a lie. And there are plenty of churches today and plenty of teachings today that will tell you that. And there are tons of people who believe that lie. The truth is that to be accepted by God, 
You need Jesus Christ alone. You don't need anything else. It's faith in Christ that will save you. So why would a person who's been brought into freedom, into liberty, want to go back into a life of trying to live and observe all these laws? In verse 12, he says, Brethren, I urge you to become as I am, for I am as you are. You have not injured me at all. You know that because of physical infirmity, I preached the gospel to you at the first, and my trial, which was in my flesh, you did not despise or reject, but you received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. What then was the blessing you enjoyed? For I bear you witness that if possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. Have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? They zealously court you, but not, for, but for no good. Yes, they want to exclude you from Paul's ministry and from the true gospel that you may be zealous for them. But it is good to be zealous in a good thing always, and not only when I am present with you. My little children for whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you. And so Paul then speaking to them as dear brothers and sisters, he's pleading with them. He says, I'm pleading with you to live as I do in freedom from these things. I want you to be like me. I'm no longer under the law. I want you to be free from these things. He says, I've become like you Gentiles, free from the law. The Gentiles weren't under the law. He refers to the fact that when he was there, they didn't mistreat him when he came and preached to them. He had been sick, as he says there in verse 13. He says, you know that because of physical infirmity, I preached the gospel to you at first. Surely you remember that I was sick when I first brought you the good news. We don't know the exact details, but when Paul traveled to these Galatian churches, he wasn't in the best of physical health, but he nonetheless preached the gospel to them. And in verse 14, he says, and my trial which was in my flesh, you did not despise or reject, but receive me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. Even though my condition tempted you to reject me, you did not despise me or turn away from me. Now, what does all of that mean? Well, nobody's really sure exactly what Paul's sickness was. Some people believe he might have contracted malaria. And, uh, I mean, if you see a really sick person coming your way, let's say a really sick person came to your door, and they said, you know, and it was very clear to you that they were really sick, you really wouldn't be inclined to welcome them into your house. Say, oh, come on in, let me kiss you, hug you, and let's sit down and hold hands, and, you know, I want to be as close to you as I possibly can. You wouldn't do that uh, if it was a communicable disease. Some people believe he had a, a eye disease, which is uh, perhaps the more verifiable one from the scriptures, a disease which caused, and please forgive me for this after-dinner conversation, but a disease which caused a pus to ooze out of his eyes. And it caused a disfiguring of his face. So try to imagine now a person, uh, he's come to Galatia to preach. Uh, he wasn't much to look at to begin with. He wasn't known to be a handsome uh, guy. But if indeed he had this disease where pus was coming out of his eyes and his face was disfigured. Again, try to picture someone coming to your door in this condition. You'd, have a, you'd be tempted to say, 
come back on another day. So he's reminding them, look, when I came to you and I had this physical infirmity, I preached the gospel to you. And he said, you didn't despise me and you didn't reject me, but rather you received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. That's really what happened. Even though he had this terrible physical condition, he came, he preached, and the people received him, and they received the message. He's trying to shake them up a little bit, saying, don't you remember what happened? Don't you remember I preached the gospel to you? Now you're, you're trying to go back into this other way? Verse 15, what then was the blessing you enjoyed? What happened to you when I preached the gospel to you? You got saved. What was the blessing? Well, the blessing was that you were forgiven. The blessing was you were born again. For I bear witness in the middle of verse 15, I bear witness that if possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. He's saying, don't you recall the, the great love that we shared? Now, he's also talking this way um, because not only were the Judaizers speaking against the message of Paul, but they were speaking against him as a person, trying to make him of no account in the eyes of these people. And he's saying, well, wait a minute. Don't you remember the love that we shared? You, you received me as if I was an angel from heaven or if it was the Lord himself. In fact, you were so welcoming to me, you loved me so much that you would have plucked out your eyes and given them to me if you could have. And now you're, you're turning away from me? What happened here? And, and you know, that happens so often in church life. People come to a church, they are not saved, they hear the word of God, they get saved, they enjoy the fellowship, and then something happens, there's some problem, somebody says something, and all of a sudden, the love that existed between the congregants and the leadership and the pastor, it's all of a sudden, it's, it's as if it never happened. And if you could stop and say, well, wait a minute, what, what was it that you heard, and what happened to you, and what did God do in your life through the ministry, and what was that relationship that we shared, and, and why are you now... Uh, withdrawing your fellowship. What, what could it possibly be? Oh, well, we, we heard this about you, or somebody said this about you, or they said the, this is what you're teaching. So that's what, the same thing that was happening then. It's the same way life goes on today. In verse 16, he says, Have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? They'd gone from receiving him as Christ himself to now considering him an enemy. Tremendous statement here. Have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? The answer really was yes. He, he had become their enemy. But it was a, an unfair position for him to be in. He merely had told them the truth. And now they were considering him as an enemy. In verse 17, he begins to describe the activities of these false teachers. And it's been this way, it always will be. And here they are in verse 17, they zealously court you. You know, when a man is courting a woman, he's trying to get her to love him and to marry him. It's a courtship. He's trying to draw her into his life, and he wants to go and be in her life. He says, these false teachers, they're zealously courting you. And they were. They were actively, energetically going after these converts. He said, but for no good. What they're courting you for is not for good. Yes, he said, they want to exclude you. Now he's really getting down to what their real motive was. 
They want to exclude you from the teaching of the gospel of grace. They want to remove you from the clear teaching that salvation is by grace and by faith. It's by faith in Christ alone. They want to exclude you from that. And they want to draw you into the law and put you under legalism. They want to exclude you that you may be zealous for them. They want to turn you into legalists. They want to disciple you into their preaching of this false doctrine so that you now are zealous for legalism. Concerning zeal, he says in verse 18, but it is good to be zealous in a good thing always. He's, he says zeal is a good thing, but it's, it's only good if it's in a good thing. And, not, and he says, and not only when I am present with you, my little children for whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you. He's, he's using the, this uh, language to speak of calling himself a father and laboring in birth. He says, we're having to go right back to the basics. I'm, I'm laboring now to... Make sure you're truly saved and, and until Christ is formed in you, until you grow. Um, tragic, tragic thing to go from grace to legalism. In verse 20, I would like to be present with you now and change my tone. He said, I wish I could be there and, and wouldn't have to speak in this manner, for I have doubts about you. He says, I feel like I'm going through labor pains for you again. And they will continue until Christ is fully developed in your lives. I wish I was with you right now so I could change my tone. But at this distance, I don't know how else to help you. In verse 21, he asks them a question. He says, tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? Those of you who want to go off into the law, do you not hear the law? Don't you even hear it? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and he of the free woman through promise, which things are symbolic. For these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar, the bondwoman. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free which is the mother of us all, for it is written, Rejoice, O barren, yes, you who do not bear, break forth and shout, you who do not travail, for the desolate has many more children than she who has a husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac, are children of promise. But as he who was born according to the flesh then persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, even so... It is now, nevertheless, what does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children, but the woman, the, but ch we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. So uh, let me just go back over this before we end and try to uh, help you make sense of this. He says, you want to go back under the law? He says, don't you hear what the law said? Do you remember the story of Abraham? The scripture says that Abraham had two sons, right? One from his slave wife and one from his freeborn wife. The son of the slave wife was born in a human attempt to bring about the fulfillment of God's promise, but the son of the freeborn wife was born as God's own fulfillment of his promise. 
Um, if you were to do the chronology, God gave Abraham a promise, but it was many years later before he fulfilled it. The promise was that he and his wife were going to have a child, and, and um, they waited upon the Lord, and they, they uh, weren't having a child. And so Abraham's wife suggested, well, look, why don't you take my maidservant and have relationships with her? You can marry, and marry her and have relations with her. And uh, after a couple of years, she became pregnant and gave birth to a boy named Ishmael. And that boy grew up until he was about 13 or so years old. And at that point, now Abraham and his wife Sarah were uh, really old. There was absolutely no possibility of them having a child. Yet God had promised that they would have a child, but what they did is they waited and waited, and they became impatient, so they said, well, we're going to go ahead and help God out, and we're going to bring about this promise by our own efforts. And then when they were so old that it was clear to anybody who had a brain in their head these people cannot have a baby. I mean, imagine if 200-year-old people walked in uh, along with a sick person at your door. You've got quite a group in your home now. You've got one with malaria, one with pussy eyes, and two old people. Imagine if they said, guess what? I'm, we're pregnant. You'd say, how could that be? What God did is he allowed circumstances to be such that when the baby finally did come, it was clearly evident that it was truly the work of God. It wasn't the work of man. You see, God is the one who fulfilled his promise. And what Abraham was called to do was to believe him. And that's the way that God calls us to act. What Abraham and his wife did, and it was really Sarah who cooked up the idea, is they said, well, this isn't working. God's promise isn't working, so let's do something to make it happen. That's called the work of the flesh. And so around the time that Ishmael was about 13 years old and Isaac was now about three years old, uh, there started to become jealousy and Ishmael began to uh, mock the boy, and Hagar and Sarah weren't getting along too well. And what happened was that God instructed Abraham to cast her out and to cast Ishmael out. And then later God had mercy and grace upon her. But these things are symbolic. In other words, God was saying, I reject human effort to accomplish the work of God. I don't need human effort to accomplish my work. I will accomplish my work. All I want you to do is trust me. And he's saying that in verse 24, these things are symbolic of two covenants. One is Mount Sinai, which is the law, and Jerusalem, the Jews in Jerusalem were still under bondage. He says, but the other, the other wife is the Jerusalem above, which is free, which is the mother of us all. And then quoting from the Old Testament about all of the people who would become saved. And then he says in verse 28, now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise, God is the one who fulfilled his promise and brought forth Isaac. And he's saying, we're the children, we brethren, as Isaac, are children of promise. We have believed the promise of God and we've become saved. But he who was born according to the flesh then persecuted him who was born according to the spirit. Even so it is now. The Arab nations came out of Ishmael. And even to back then and even to this day, 
they're persecuting the Jews. And even to this day, legalists persecute true Christians. If you're not doing what they say, they, they persecute you. They tell you that you're not legitimate. Nevertheless, in spite of all that, he says, what does the scripture say? He's, he's, he asked them in verse 21, tell me you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? So he gave them a history lesson. He went all through their history. And there in verse 30, he's winding it up and he says, well, what does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. Uh, the works of the flesh have no place with God. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. We're not in relationship with God through the works of the flesh, but rather by the promise of God. So, um, Paul's argument. trying to defend the gospel of grace, trying to tell people who were listening to lies to stop listening to lies and to get back to the truth of Jesus Christ. Bondage. Legalism is bondage. It's like living in a prison. And if you're involved in legalism and you're in that prison, it's time to make an escape. It's time to be set free. And the reason is because we've been called to liberty. God hasn't called us to relate to him based on our performance. He's called us to relate to him based on his grace. We've been called to liberty. And, and if you find yourself in, you know, imprisoned by legalism that's come into your life, here's three things you can do to help make a prison break. Number one, learn and believe that God has accepted you by grace. Really think about that. Learn and believe that God has accepted you by grace. I, I would really challenge you to really ponder that. To really stop and think, okay, God has truly accepted me totally by his grace. Really to get yourself squared away. And he does this, the Bible says, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he made us, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. How does God make you accepted? By his grace. Not by your attainment, not by your works, not by your striving. Grace is God's acceptance of us. Faith is our acceptance of God's acceptance of us. Let me repeat that. Grace is God's acceptance of us. Faith is our acceptance of God's acceptance of us. We believe God. So learn and believe that God has accepted you by grace, not by what you do. You don't have to attain acceptance by what you do. Number two, accept yourself. In God's eyes, you are special. The Bible says that. God has accepted you. So if God has accepted you, then accept yourself. That doesn't mean you make peace with sin or sloppiness or laziness or arrogance, but reprogram your self-concept, say with the Apostle Paul, I am what I am by the grace of God. To accept yourself, God has accepted me. And I'm telling you, you know, <laughs> these are things that they may sound very simple, but when you really start thinking about them, you, you realize, you know, I wonder how much of this truth is really in my life, where I really recognize God has completely accepted me. There's not a thing I can, you can't improve upon perfection. I need to accept the fact that he has accepted me. The third step to a jailbreak, 
of legalism is learn to accept other people. Don't demand perfection out of anybody because they can't give it. I mean, if we can't be perfect, well, why should we expect someone else to be perfect? Remember, they don't have to earn their acceptance with God, so why should they have to earn it with you? And this is an area where, uh, again, it would be good for us to give some thought to. Don't expect perfection from other people. Don't demand it from other people. When you accept other people, not only do you free them to be all they can be, but you free yourself. Hey, you're a, you're a Christian. Okay, good. I accept you. And when you escape the performance trap, you'll not do less. You'll probably do more. You know, people always criticize the gospel of grace, they say, well, look, if you tell people that all they have to do to be accepted is to believe God, aren't they going to just go wild and go crazy? Paul says in Romans 6, absolutely not. How can we who have died to sin? If, if you really accept the grace of God, you're going to find yourself not doing less for God, but doing more for him. You'll actually achieve more if you accept the grace of God. You'll enjoy it a whole lot more. You'll be a better parent, a better spouse, a better servant of God. So make a break today from legalism if you're involved in it and enjoy the freedom that is yours in the Lord Jesus Christ. So just stop with me for a moment and think about this. Right this very moment, if you're a Christian, God has completely, totally accepted you, and he sees you as completely righteous in his sight. Do you believe that? I mean, do you believe it enough to where it actually is a blessing to you? I mean, just think about it. Do you really believe? Because I'm working on it myself, so. There, there's nothing I can do to make him love me more. He just loves me. Nothing can separate me from his love. He's already given me a perfect standing with him. I like the part about if he accepts me and doesn't require perfection from me, he just accepts me by faith, that's how I need to treat other people as well. And I, I think that may be the bigger problem, is how we regard one another, how we treat one another. Because God accepts you just as much as he accepts me. We're, we're on level ground here. You're, not any, you're certainly not any better than me, I can tell you that by looking at you. So when you wake up tomorrow morning, enjoy your day. Just say, well, Lord, good morning. I'm your child. I'm your son. I'm your daughter. I'm an heir of God. You've accepted me. Christ has saved me. You've given me the Holy Spirit. I have a relationship with you. You've given me your word to feed my soul. And I'm going to enjoy you teaching me. I want to draw close to you and love you and be loved by you. And I want to offer my life to you and let you use my life. And God's going to say, no, you're not good enough. You, you haven't jumped high. No, no, he's not going to say that. He's going to say, that's, that's it right there. That's what I want you to do. Well, let's have the ushers come on up, please, and we'll receive the tithes and the offerings.
Father, the people who are in heaven at this moment are totally, completely aware of the fact that the reason they are in heaven has absolutely nothing to do with any good work they ever did in their lives. But the reason they are in heaven has everything to do with Jesus Christ, the Redeemer. Lord Jesus, you are the one who shed your blood to pay for our sins. When we get to heaven, Lord, we'll fully appreciate what you've done for us, but while we're here, we know that you want us to grow in the grace and the knowledge of Christ. So, Lord, would you please help us to understand what you've done for us and help us, Lord, to not have ideas that are outside of the Bible about what makes us acceptable. Help us, Lord, to walk in your grace and to trust you. All power, all glory, all honor belongs to you. And we desire to give that to you and seek to live that way. And Lord, we ask now that you might receive from us these tithes that are being given, these offerings that are being given, and you would receive them from us as those who worship you. In Jesus' name we pray.